so a uh, traditional Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. Hi, Preston. <laughs> Hi, Katie. It's been two weeks. <laughs> as far as anyone. As far as anyone. It's not our Discord knows. <laughs> knows. And I, uh, but having an existential crisis. Oh, yeah. Tell me more. I don't know what to expect <laughs> when this is all over. Well, I got nothing. <laughs> but we're going to find out more on what someone might expect on well, today's episode of The, the Holy, Holy Watermelon, Watermelon Podcast. Podcast. I set it up. <laughs> and I just... Life is hard sometimes. That's fine. And then you die. And then you meet... A whole bunch of people. Somebody. Somebody. <laughs> Actually, I mean, it sounds like you'll meet at least two somebodies. Right. There's usually a judge. There's usually a psychopomp. And which the... which is a, a menacing sounding title. I love that <laughs> word. I wish I could use it more in everyday life. Right. Um, and then you have your like minder. Like you're now the pet. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Right. So I want to start this off with a little bit of dispelling long-held myths. The dude with the black cloak and the scythe. Now, almost every every instance that this figure appears in popular culture and digital media, whatever, he's always called death. Almost always. The Grim Reaper, which, which is this character, is not death. Death is the one that has the power to kill. And sometimes, like, the Grim Reaper on Family Guy. I was going to say The Sims. Sure. Uh, sometimes these get combined. This is erroneous, fallacious, wrong. <laughs> Actually, I was going to say the one on The Sims isn't death because The Sim dies and then so death So there comes. you've got what I'll call a psychopomp. He, so we've got the, the collector of the dead, which is where that title Reaper comes from. The bone man is not death when done correctly. And also, Hades, not the god of death. We get a lot of ideas that end up getting crossed in popular culture. So we're going to straighten that out today. Yep. Uh, we are going to start with gods of the netherworld. These are the minders. They're not killing you. They're not guiding you. They're minding the place yeah. where you go. Yeah, minding the place where you go. They, not, they don't necessarily mind the dead. Though, it, by minding the place where they live, that's that's a sort of care. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you do with the places. Yeah. It, you know. And we get some variety there, too. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, let's start with Hades. All right. Because that's what he does. Hades Town, excellent musical, basically explains this. Yeah. He's the oh, king yeah. of the underworld. That's one of the lyrics. Okay. Cool. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Hades Town. If our listeners don't know about this by now, I do enjoy a good musical. Hades Town is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. And Eurydice goes to the underworld, even though she doesn't die, and Orpheus goes to rescue. It's weird how many mortals are allowed to go to the realm of Hades and not be dead. Yes. <laughs> that's the, I mean, you could Google the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, um, and that's like a modern interpretation, right? Oh. They don't, they're not wearing togas. Lame. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, so that's the musical. All right. Well, in the old Hellenic tradition, Hades is just the king of the underworld in the same way that Zeus is the king of Olympus. The underworld is sometimes called the house of Hades. Because, you know, it's nice to be recognized for ruling a place. In stories, Hades is not really the bad guy. He's certainly not as rapey as Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> but he is generally pitiless, doesn't really care about prayer or sacrifice either. It's pretty... Apathetic. Yeah. Um, but people will occasionally offer sacrifices to him, mostly in the hopes of getting some treasure from the earth, usually is the deal there. Because you're not going to get your dead back. That's never never really the a religious intent. I mean, people have definitely wished for their dead to return, but it's not with religious intent in the Hellenic tradition. No. Yeah. So Hades rules the underworld with his three-headed dog, Kerberos, which I think we've mentioned on the podcast before, is just a great Greek name for Spot. So he has a three-headed dog named Spot. <laughs> Can you not like Hades after that? Yeah, often we'll translate this because 
a lot of the Greek stuff comes to us through Latin translations because we're lazy, I guess. I don't know. It's weird. We've shifted this name to Cerberus instead of Kerberos, but Spot. Spot. Spot's his real name. <laughs> There's also Persephone, the wife of Hades, who is the goddess of spring. So there's, there's a good handful of people who aren't dead that live here. By the 5th century BCE, uh, the Greeks started referring to Hades as Pluton. This is a name that refers to the wealth of the ground and all of the good things that come out of it. And this is also where the Romans got the name Pluto. And the name Hades eventually came to be adopted as just the name of the underworld generally. The, the fire on his head, nice touch by Disney, not generally part of his deal. He would wear a helmet that made him invisible. Cool. That was a, a pretty cool superpower. So he's a sneaky guy, but he's not evil like Zeus. Yeah, and you're, he's not good either, but he's not... No, to say like any a, of the gods are good is tricky. like a neutral alignment in D&D. Sure. There are some of the gods who are pretty good, but the big ones, neutral at best. Another ruler of the underworld is Wasir. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Wasir, and he's from the Kemetic tradition. So the Greeks knew him as Osiris. Oh. And so this is the common name that we use today when we talk about Egyptian mythology. He's one of several judges of the dead, but it is his kingdom that people hope to join. Those who were found unworthy would be relegated for a short period of torture in the d domain of Amit, the devourer of souls, before he released them from existence. I like that, that the torture isn't permanent, but it is the last thing you get to do, is go through this torture. <laughs> and then you get eaten by this demon as a soul of some kind, whether corporal or not, it's a little fuzzy. And then you're gone. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. <laughs> not even taxes? One would hope that the taxation <laughs> would end at death. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, let's be real. Anybody who has to deal with filing taxes on the regular knows that taxation ends a while after death. <laughs> but it does affect the dead person, so that's nice. Right. It just affects everybody left behind. <laughs> So this imagery of the devouring of souls informed the early Judeo-Christian concept of torture for dead sinners. Yeah. So this would be like um, purgatory? No, more like the act, like Actual. full on hell. Okay. Uh, except with the whole idea, the Christians were very into the immortality of the soul. We don't have in any Christian tradition that I'm aware of something that really can finally destroy a soul. So the torture must be endless. Yeah. That's the rule. Oh. Not my favorite version of Christian cosmology, but it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> when an Egyptian king died, he would be resurrected and join Osiris. Yes. Osiris is tightly bound to all the pharaohs. So that's kind of a nice little promise for the kings. The rest of us don't get that. <laughs> and so while underworld deities typically get a bad rap, Osiris would also grant life from the underworld by flooding the Nile River every year. Nice. Yeah. That's kind. In the desert, that's a pretty good bit of news. Keep the land nice and fertile. Because Osiris was the resurrected king and would bring forth growth from the Nile River, he also became associated with the idea of cycles of life after death. Remember our episode on trickster gods? Yeah. Loki had a daughter. I don't know if this was when he was a horse or not. Uh, no, not this one. Um, he, he had one child as a horse. Sleep. And that was sleep near. Right. Yeah. Like Loki, Hel is a giant. Oh, this is Loki's daughter. And she was predicted to overthrow Asgard. So she was sent to the depths of the coldest nether realm. Niflheim. Niflheim. That's not how I would have said it. Thanks, Preston. Where the dead would go if they were not counted worthy to be collected by the Valkyries, specifically, to prevent the predicted fate of Asgard, or selected by Freya. So Norse tradition, you have a few places you can go when you die. We're going to touch on a couple of them. So if you weren't worthy, you went to hell. Right. <laughs> is that where we get yeah. the word? Yeah. From? The hell that we have in English is derived from this woman. Cool. I mean, I guess I could have assumed that. But. <laughs> yeah, a lot of our English bits come from Germanic language. Being a living giant in the realm of the dead, she became the goddess of the netherworld where she ruled. She wasn't naturally a goddess, much in the same way that Loki wasn't really naturally a god. Did you know Hel and I have something in common? Yeah. 
that she's beautiful if you see her from the right angle and in the right light, but half of her face and body was horribly disfigured. The very image of death. Are you trying to tell me that you look just awful? Have you seen some <laughs> pictures of me? I, when I take a photo, <laughs> it can go one of two ways, Preston. <laughs> And it's about 50-50 out there in the world right now. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. <laughs> if uh, anyone I... cites this in our Discord, I will post a horrible picture. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So make sure you're the first to post this in our Discord. And you can be the reason that this photo gets shared. Yeah. <laughs> I have no shame. I know what I look like. <laughs> Very nice. Some suggest that she is the personification of a pre-existing place named hell. It feels a lot more likely that we're looking at something similar to how the Greek tradition evolved, Hades. that it was a person first and then a place name. It's hard to prove things that far back in history. And they didn't write the prose edda or the poetic edda until the... In, century. Until the Christians had taken over. Yeah. Yeah. That's what this is written down, so. So these are gods of the dead, but not the gods... Of death. Right. And I think that's an important distinction. Uh, even though in Mar Thor Ragnarok, a very entertaining movie that has, if you've been listening carefully, has ignored almost all of the good details <laughs> of Norse mythology. And he Hela even says that she is the goddess of death. That is not correct mythology. She just... She's the, the minder yeah. of the dead. I mean, that, that wasn't even really the intent when they sent her to Niflheim. It was, you, you need to go away because you're going to cause troubles for us. That's what the prophecy said. So go very far away. And since you look dead, go be with the dead. Wow. <laughs> so rude. Yeah. Odin was a dick. <laughs> Uh, before we get into the gods of death, we're going to talk about psychopomps. This next, this next stage, or I guess the previous stage. Yeah. Of getting. Yeah, how do you get? To what the we're line doing of the is death? we're walking backwards through this system. Yes. So you've been you've been minded, but how did you get there? You got there from a psychopomp. So psychopomps are guides for the souls to places of the dead because the dead just aren't everywhere. We got to be conveyed there from wherever we died. So psychopomps across cultures are often shown carrying torches to signify their role as guides. Sometimes they'll carry a scroll that is a map of some kind, or like we mentioned with Mr. Bone Man, a scythe. Yeah. No, I found the torch really interesting because we're going to touch on one in the Aztec, Aztec region, religion, uh, that carries a torch. And then there's one in the, I forget which one, but there is one in the Middle East that also carries a torch because they're guides and I thought that was really interesting too cultures that would never have interacted have psychopomps let's start with this grim reaper that we touched on at the top of the episode all right so the earliest mention of death as the grim reaper was in 1847 in a book called the circle of human life which sounds like a really interesting book circle of life. <laughs> the grim reaper is a scythe wielding skeleton who collects the souls of the recently dead. If you've ever seen Monty Python and the Meaning of Life, he says, I am death, which unfortunately is another example of the Grim Reaper not really being what he's supposed to be. I love that The Sims is the most accurate. Of most of the things in pop culture, yeah. I think it was the, the fish in uh, Monty Python and the Meaning of Life. So it was food poisoning that killed them. Oh. And then the Grim Reaper showed up to collect them, even though he said, I am death. Mm. No. I thought it was really interesting. The Grim Reaper has been portrayed both as male and female, depending on where you're from. So most people in North America know the Grim Reaper to be male. But in Spain, France, and Italy, she is portrayed as a woman. And I didn't put this in the notes, but that's because the word muerta is a, is a feminine word. Right. We don't have gendered language in... Yeah, English doesn't gender everything the way yeah, a lot yeah, of the... feminine nouns and masculine nouns. Yeah. Like they do in uh, the, the romantic thing. Well, not even the romantic thing, which is German does it too, and German's a Germanic language. But yeah. uh, English is oversimplified to the point that it's difficult for other, other people, people to, to understand. learn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so anyway, that's why in those countries death is a woman because it's a feminized 
So the Grim Reaper image is constructed from the idea of harvesting souls. So the scythe is actually never the implement of death. It's just a symbol of the role. Unless you were killed in a freak farming accident. But then the Grim Reaper didn't do it. Right. It's still, it's still not... The one he carries is not the implement of your death. He's just carrying it. Yeah. Size? Really do look ominous though in a sure in a post industrial world when you don't see them all. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're away from a farm and you see a dude walking with a scythe, you can't help but wonder what's this guy doing. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Next on our list, we have the Valkyries. These were badass women, right? Also in Thar Ragnarok, yeah, uh, in Norse mythology. These are warrior women that would carry the dead to Valhalla, and specific, that matters specifically to Valhalla, yeah. so not to hell and or where Frey is, which we'll get to. Valkyrie means chooser of the slain, and they specifically escort warriors who have died in battle, because that's basically the only noble way to die in Norse culture. Those who die in battle can actually go to one of two places, so... Odin's Valhalla or Freya's Folkfanger. The Valkyrie chooses which half, so it is half. Odin gets in Valhalla and the other goes to Folkfanger. The warriors in Valhalla are preparing for Ragnarok and will fight alongside Odin and the Valkyries. And those that hang out with Freya just actually get to enjoy some sort of peace. Yeah, I actually would prefer <laughs> that. I know it's probably shameful, but... I don't know. They still died honorably, but, but they're they weren't not... good enough to be chosen for Ragnarok. Right. <laughs> it's like being a C student in the honors class. <laughs> it's like you're with the smart kids, but you're the dumbest of the smart kids. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I don't know if everyone else is, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they know where to find me. Sure. <laughs> we have Yama. Uh, the Hindu god who served both death and justice. Yama is also known as Kala or Damaraja, depending on who you talk to. Uh, Yama was the first mortal who died and found his own way to the celestial afterlife and thereby became the guide for the deceased, showing everybody else the way. That's kind of a, a really good angle. Not everybody is benevolent when they find their own way to someplace. Right. I thought this was really interesting and we probably could do a whole episode on resurrection and things like that but yama is worshipped by hindus because he determines where souls end up and you go but wait katie it's hinduism they're all resurrected oh we've Wrong. talked about this in our ghost episode yes that's that true things are a little more complicated in hinduism than popular culture would lead you to believe so the notes i read said that souls can go to heaven but they mean moksha hinduism mm. doesn't <laughs> they can be reincarnated of course that's what we know most commonly in Hinduism, or they can enter one of the 21 realms of hell. Right. 21. Or alternatively, stick around as an angry ghost demon. Right. That, yeah. <laughs> I feel like Yama's just like, I'm washing my hands of you. <laughs> I'm not guiding you anywhere. anywhere. That's how bad you were, <laughs> is you don't even deserve one of the 21. 21 <laughs> realms of hell. Well, sure. Because there's all kinds of different ways to be bad and ways that you can make yourself unwanted by everybody. <laughs> uh, I also thought this was interesting and I clearly need a refresher, but Yama also appears in Buddhist traditions where they mostly just worship the Buddha. Right. But I guess it is a polytheistic religion. B well, Buddhism is a weird nebulous thing. We've talked about this before, that there's a lot of traditions within Buddhism and because Buddhism did originate in the Hindu setting, there is some Hindu, uh, some Buddhist schools that do still incorporate some of this Hindu cosmology. Yama, obviously not monolithic, but he can be found in Buddhist worship as well. Next on our list, we have Anubis, also known more anciently and correctly as Anpu. Oh, I like that. Uh, in the Egyptian desert, jackals were generally just going to be a lot of trouble for the dead, digging up their bodies and chewing them to pieces and making it really difficult to make safe passage to the underworld. So Anpu was invoked to prevent this problem. So it was Anpu's job to make sure that the souls of the dead made it safely to the judgment bar, where he is often depicted as being the one holding the scales of justice. 
Right. So he's not just the guide, he's also one of the judges. Okay. One of many, uh, we mentioned earlier that Osiris is also one of those judges. You gotta go to the front of a whole panel. Yeah. It's like RuPaul's Drag Race. I think it's worse. Some of them are my, are mighty sassy. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're talking about RuPaul's Drag Race <laughs> or the Egyptian pantheon. No clarification offered. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Happy Pride, everyone. <laughs> the Japanese folk religion, Shinto, has its own guides, sort of. They're called Shinigami, which is the type of kami that lure humans towards death. So this is a little different than a psychopomp in, in, in some aspects, but they will also do the psychopomp thing, right? Well, they're a guy that's just, they typically do it before you die as opposed to after. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they do this by possessing a person and leading them towards seas, railroads, or mountains where people have died. Oh, great. <laughs> come here, Preston. Come to the top of this building. So... In Japan, there's a few places where, like, this is just a place for suicide. Oh, yeah, there's suicide forest. Yeah, it's spooky. It is. Um, that comes from some pop culture thing. I believe you. I don't know. There's honestly almost nothing that I know from any sort of osmosis on the Japanese. Yeah, there was, like, some... I'll have to look this up and I'll put it on Discord. But there was like some book or movie or poem that sort of romanticized dying in this forest. And then people started doing it. And then because of the So what you're saying is that it, young Japanese people are really dumb. <laughs> yeah, are really mentally ill. I mean, young people everywhere can are really be said dumb. to be dumb pretty reliably. <laughs> anyway, Shinigami. Come to the top of the mountain, Preston. Um... Shinigami, however, are mostly absent from folk writings. There are some mentions of them during the Edo period, which was about 1600 to 1850. We actually see a lot of Shinigami in popular modern Japanese culture where they appear in animes. Uh, the two most famous that I found were Death Note and Bleach. So I've heard of Bleach. And I've enjoyed Death Note. And I've enjoyed Bleach and heard of Death Note. <laughs> nice. So we got our bases covered yeah. between the two of us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Brian was really into Bleach. Oh, gosh, this is years ago. It was like two. I In my brain, I go by house that we sure. lived in. It was like two houses ago. Yeah, that we watched Bleach. Okay. That's a good little while ago. Yeah. Yeah. Like five plus years ago, easily. Axolotl. <laughs> is an adorable lizard yeah but Zolotl does not have an axe <laughs> oh my goodness Brian sent me a meme and it was an axolotl holding a knife and it said you axolotl questions <laughs> <laughs> oh no and I thought it was the cutest thing sure did I kick you I'm sorry no you axolotl questions <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, sorry, let's talk about Zolotl. <laughs> so Zolotl is an Aztec deity that is depicted with a dog head, kind of like Anubis or Anpu, but also as a skeleton or deformed monster. So not terribly friendly. He is the god of monsters, death, sickness, and misfortune. And so he guides the dead to Mixlan, the Aztec underworld. But there's a reason that he's a dog. When someone died, their dogs would be sacrificed with them to help them to journey to Miklan. So he's basically the personification of all these dead dogs. I'm like torn because I, I hate the thought of a dog just being killed because the owner dies. But also like, man's his friend. Well, and you see so many dogs like really depressed when their owner dies. Right. This does save them from that. Yeah. If you don't expect them to have a good life without their owner i, I guess. mean when you see dogs crying in front of pictures or at grave yeah. sites it's pretty sad yeah i guess it's counted as a mercy by the people doing it so. but that's that's the, the tradition anyway and so there's also lots of sculpture sculptures and burial sites for dogs in the aztec area that's cool yeah i already told someone to bury me next to Paige. 
Sounds good. I'm telling you now, too. And the whole world. Yeah. Which is the yard here, right? I mean, her ashes are on the on the shelf, but we have a marker for her in the yard. Okay. So when I go, just put us together. Just put you together. Not just put you where she happens to currently be. <laughs> no, that'd be really weird. Um, we'll put you on the mantle. Whoever buys the house has yeah, to keep you there. Keep us all. <laughs> or we'll haunt it. Nice. Next we have Hermes. Or Mercury. Or Hermes. Not like the sweater. Or sure. the scarf. Anyway. <laughs> Mercury was a new invention for the Romans when they adopted the figure of Hermes from the Greeks. Because the Romans are always stealing. Yeah. And in this case, they just renamed him. They didn't amalgamate him with their pre-existing god. They actually abandoned a god in favor of Hermes and then gave him a new name. Mercury was the one responsible for carrying dreams from Morpheus to sleeping folk, carrying messages for the gods, and as his name suggests, he was the god of the good merch. <laughs> Mercuries. <laughs> Mercuries. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. I might Speaking have... of merch. <laughs> I was going to say, we'll invoke him at the end of the episode. But... <laughs> good old Her Mercury. <laughs> like. That's not a very good portmanteau, but I tried. <laughs> Would guide the freshly dead to the underworld as well. Uh, it feels like a weird collection of things to be responsible for as a god. Uh, but it's what we got. He was, the, he was the gopher. I get it. Sure. He's running. He's the yeah. courier. Right. He's running shit back and forth. But he's not the only psychopomp for the Greeks and Romans. We'll get more into that later. Okay. So... He would guide the freshly dead to the underworld, but he wouldn't help you cross the river. He would just get you there. Uh, even though he was absolutely fast enough. He got wings on his sandals. He's got wings on his helmet. The guy's got no wings on his back. And he's got regular human arms. But he's got all these extra wings. Super fast. Won't cross the river. That happens in Hades Town too. He helps Orpheus get there he tells her he's how to get there but he doesn't help him get there right instead there's another psycho pump mm. the sequel pump <laughs> oh a sequel pump <laughs> and no matter who tells you otherwise it is not chiron okay you sound passionate about this tell me more i i've heard a lot of people who feel like they've really newly discovered greek mythology or roman mythology because it's the same figure in both. And they're like, his name is Chiron. No, it's Karen. <gasps> <laughs> and Karen is the bad bitch that takes you to the manager across the river Styx, or Acheron, or both, if you came prepared to pay the toll, which only happens if somebody else who is still alive thought you were worth putting money in your mouth. Oh. Yeah. I hope so. Right? If you're not a good person in life, and, and nobody thinks you're worth it. Nobody's going to give you the toll money to pay the river man. The, the ferry man. The troll toll. Sure. For the boy's soul. <laughs> Very poetic. I like, like it. Well, it's from Always Sunny. You've seen I have. My man. Been too long. Okay. So Karen is depicted in both the Sistine Chapel and the Divine Comedy, showing both the Roman influence on the Catholic tradition and the desire for a psychopomp in the imperial tradition that didn't have a popular figure to adopt from Judaism. Yeah, Christianity doesn't have our own real psychopomp. We've, more recently, we've talked about how angels will guide you and protect you, but it's not really part of the classic tradition. Right. So Karun is the Etruscan near equivalent of Karen, except that he guards the entrance to the underworld with a hammer. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is he guiding people or is he just standing guard? Everybody in, in studies on this subject matter talks about him as a psychopomp. He's depicted on a lot of art in burial sites and burial related things. But it looks, it looks like he's a guard who maybe helps a little bit as a guide. It's a little bit weird. And there's a, a little bit of variety around this character. There's some argument, and it's kind of interesting to see what role he plays in these arguments. But generally, he's expected to be some sort of guide. And there's some questions about the hammer that he wields. Some art has him 
smashing people. Other art has him smashing snakes who may be trying to attack the people that he's supposed to be guiding. So maybe he's a little bit of a judge, too. Okay. It's kind of interesting. Karun, like typical Etruscan underworld demons, is not really as humaniform as you might hope. He's usually got weird boar face or horns, and pointy ears, Medusa's snake hair. Oh, cool. Sometimes Karun has snake hair and wings. He's always, well, almost always got wings. So spooky to look at. Doesn't look like he's going to be your friend. Sounds like a Lovecraftian Almost. horror. What? I don't know. The The Greeks and the, the Romans really like just putting things they didn't like on people to make them look scarier. Or building monsters from chunks of other monsters. We all weird. did that as a kid. We all had that sure. book. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to spin the wheel, see what mo monster parts you can add to these other two chunks. Yeah, or like yeah. the little flip books where you can flip. Or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That flip out the chunks. Yeah. 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 You yeah. get it. So you had a lot of different images of Karun. But there's the other side of the same tradition. The Etruscans had a different psychopomp who was not quite as scary. I thought she was pretty cool. <laughs> so Vance doesn't wield a hammer. Uh, but she's a... A de another demon who is notably female. And you can, I was going to say, you can see her boobs in most of the art. Yeah, she's got little straps across her chest, but they are Nothing. not there to cover anything. They're just hold to, or there to hold something on her back, I yeah, guess. Yeah, so I, like one, her of wings things, are one, of, on. one of the things I read is that she's dressed like a Greek hunter, much like Artemis would be dressed. Right. So that's one of the reasons they think she was a psychopomp. Right. It's just the kind of the nomadic traversing protection thing we've talked about yeah and she's much more benevolent uh, this dichotomy of psychopomps is kind of interesting the interesting in the etruscan tradition that eventually was wiped out in favor of the roman tradition that the wicked would be escorted by a rather abusive karun and then the virtuous would be guided by a more benevolent vance yeah. She escorts the dead in a variety of ways, including chariot, horseback, or wagon. So this is all on uh, typically tombs. You can see this imagery. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know, maybe faster than a, a ferry <laughs> across the river. Well, the wagon would be pretty slow. But yeah, the other two, chariot and horseback, sound pretty, right. pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. And so those are our, our psychopomps, the guides, the ones who ferry you from the point of death, which we'll get to now. Yeah, how do you actually die, Preston? So This first one I thought was super interesting. Yeah, I, I like Thanatos. Tell me about Thanatos. Well, he's the literal personification of death. Death, the, the, the doing, the mm -hmm. act of death in the Greek tradition. He doesn't actually show up a lot. He's a pretty minor character in Greek stories, and he rarely shows up in person. And he is considered merciless and is hated by both gods and humans. But that's not the cool well, thing. Uh, my brain was like, this is so cool. This is why Preston likes words. And now that you have heard this, you won't unhear it. But Thanatos, his name becomes the root for a lot of things associated with death. So cool thanatophobia is the fear of things associated with death so if you're scared of graveyards or morgues or corpses corpses is a special area because there's also necrophobia but mm -hmm. corpses can kind of be included there but this one blew my mind is euthanasia it means the good death in greek and the kevorkian his his machine mm -hmm. used in euthanasia of humans uh was called like a I forget exactly, but it was like a thanatomometer or something. Like he, <laughs> I right. can look it up, but it used, again, the, the Thanatos as the base for the name of right. his machine. And so this name also lives on in the Marvel universe. Even in the cinematic universe, we have Thanos, yep. who is very interested in death, though not in the same way he is in the other Marvel media where he legit wants to date Death, who is a woman rather than a man. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so Moors is the Roman equ equivalent of Thanatos. Which we also see in a lot of root words. For oh, yeah. 
immortality. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So. And in the same way where we have a word that basically means death being personified, mot is an old Semitic word that basically means death and is, mot is the deity of the ancient Semitic religion pre-Judaism. And we see manifestations of this figure in the Canaanite religion. And even in the Hebrew Bible, we have death personified, not meant to be seen as the god of death, but it's easy enough to see it that way when you look at the book. So Mot is the son of El and the enemy of Bel Hadad, who is one of the great lords of this pre-Jewish yeah, Faith. he's all about life and fertility and growth. Yeah. And yeah, he was a storm god. Yeah. Lots of good fun. And very similar in a lot of ways to another son of El, who is known as Yahweh. Um, and sometimes some versions of the mythology locally would combine the two. Um, but we also see a lot of conflict between the two. Okay. So Mot is said to rule over barren places and to be responsible for sterility in any form. <laughs> Yeah, so not just death, death, but the prevention of life. That's pretty extreme. Yeah, that's... Pretty metal. Sure. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of conflict between life and death, because those of us who are alive would rather stay that way. <laughs> right. Yeah. At least most of us. I'll admit there's exceptions, but that's not a happy thing to talk about. Yeah, so I'm going to take a moment to worship Mercury <laughs> and <laughs> Katie crosses herself <laughs> I don't know how to do it any other way <laughs> and just put it on the world that we have a merch store it's called Spread Shop you can get some sweet holy watermelon merch, which helps us continue on with the podcast. We've got some pretty great art from a, a few different artists and some really good word art, too, that Katie has designed. There's other ways to support us, too. We've got Patreon, where you can get a bunch of exclusive content that we've got up on Patreon. Early release. Early release stuff. And you can connect to the San Linatus Fellowship. And eventually be priestesized. Yeah. All right. Well. Or, ordained, I think, is the word you're oh, looking for. Oh, thank you. I like priestesized better. <laughs> I, um, I'm worried that priestesized in some contexts could mean just touched by a priest, oh. which is not the goal we want to advertise. <laughs> All right. If you have any questions, you can also check us out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Discord. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Peace, Peace be, be with, with you. you. By the late Middle Ages, the Christian prophecy.